is Father Tim, and uh, I'm the priest in charge in Northeast Gower, uh, in the church in Wales. I've uh, been here now for seven or eight years. I cover the churches of St. Rydia and St. Ifted, of St. David and St. Gwynor, but I'm also part of uh, the ministry area of Gower as um, the administration of, of church is changing in this time. This time, uh, I'm conscious that this, this time in church history is part of the entire time of church history. And uh, I'm standing here underneath uh, the yew tree in Llanridion, which has been here for a thousand years or more, this particular tree and another one before that, uh, linking this time with the time of the, the Celtic church and the, the saints of the sixth century, and before that, uh, the Druids in this place of Llanridion. Now, I've been a priest for about 10 years, but uh, before that I was a musician, uh, I was a teacher, I traveled a lot. I, I left uh, Gower, I was brought up in Gower, I left here when I was 17, um, having been uh, not, not the best behaved school pupil and spending a lot of my time down the beach when I should have been in school. But at 17 I took off to Europe and uh, with a guitar on my back and uh, just a few clothes and I spent three years traveling around Europe. And it was during that time that I felt the calling to, uh, to the church, uh, much to my shock and uh, I have to say annoyance at the time, uh, having wandered into a, a little church in the south of France after a long day uh, just working on the beach selling ice creams, I, I wandered in and uh, I had this uh, explosion of, of light in me and I came running out of the church and I can just remember slamming the door shut and saying at the top of my voice, God leave me alone, God leave me alone please, I, I can't do what you say. My grandfather was uh, a priest, he was the Archdeacon of Brecon and I wrote to him to tell him about this, uh, but I had the sense that uh, although God was calling me, uh, that I needed to live my life and that that was all right with God. Uh, my grandfather wrote back to me in France and said, you need to come and see the bishop. <laughs> but I don't think he really understood uh, what it was that had happened to me. And uh, it was many years before I formally explored this calling. Uh, so uh, I studied theology in Lampeter. Uh, during the 1990s and it was after that that I, I came forward to the church uh, and began the process of discern, discerning whether my calling uh, was for the church in Wales. The reaction of my family and friends to uh, my going into the ministry uh, is difficult to talk about because it's uh, over a long period of time. Some people knew when I was uh, traveling around, I was traveling with people some of the time, and they knew that uh, I had this sense of calling. Um, and when you're on the road, I mean, there's nothing strange. <laughs> there's nothing strange in, uh, in something like that. Um, but later on, after studying uh, theology in Lampeter, uh, I realized that the time had come to bring myself forward to the church and then uh, things were were kind of strange in a way. Uh, some of my family who were used to me being a musician, who were used to me living quite a, a, a wild lifestyle, uh, they, they had uh, difficulty in understanding how that could be translated into what they saw as a, of a, a rather um, formal and uh, austere church life. Um, I was married at the time, and although I came forward to, uh, to, be, to be considered for selection in the church in Wales, uh, as I got about a year into that, uh, my marriage just collapsed, and uh, I realized that there was nothing that I could do to, to keep it together. And, um, when I, I spoke to the Bishop of St. David's, that was the diocese I was going through at the time because I was living up in the mountains in, uh, in the, above Camarden. And uh, I, he, he just said, well, you know, this is the end of the road. We, there's nothing that the church can do with this. Uh, you can't be selected. And uh, so the, the whole process stopped then. Um, perhaps we'll talk about that in a minute.
So the, the process of becoming a priest, well, uh, for anybody, it's, it's not straightforward. It's uh, a time of discernment is necessary uh, with the church as well as uh, on, on your own. But uh, for me, it was a long process uh, because of uh, this problem of uh, uh, the fact that I was divorced. Uh, the church at the time uh, had no provision for me to be even tested for uh, discernment. And so I was told, well, this is the end of the road. Now, for me, that seemed very strange, and uh, I couldn't believe that was the case because I felt the calling from God. And, and for me, well, if God is calling me, then surely uh, this is something that, that can't be stopped. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I had to accept that there was no, no way that we could explore it together. And uh, so I worked with people with uh, learning disabilities for three or four years. Um, people with challenging behavior. It was the time of, uh, of Margaret Thatcher closing the, the mental hospitals and people were coming out into the community. And uh, so I found an, an incredibly powerfully uh, rewarding uh, life in that. But after about four years, uh, I felt a need to travel again and, uh, and I went to Poland to live. And it was while I was in Poland that the Bishop of St. David's got in touch with me again, saying that um, women had, had been now allowed to, to become priests in the church in Wales. And at the same time, they had changed the ruling on divorced people that uh, it was possible for them to seek this process of discernment once again. Uh, but he did say that the only problem would be uh, you, you would be able to, to apply for dispensation to seek this process. But if I was planning to remarry, there could be a problem. And um, I was planning to remarry. And I married my wife in Poland. And I was told then, in that case, we had to wait for three years before this process could continue. So finally, I came back to Wales uh, in 2003 with my wife and then uh, one child. And we've since had two more. And I have two children from my previous marriage. And uh, in 2003, again, the church said there needed to be more time. And so I found myself working in Swansea Prison for a further four years before the, the process finally began. And, um, and then I began training in Cardiff uh, and was ordained in 2007. It's not easy to talk about daily routine because every day is, is different, but uh, there are elements of routine in, in my life as a priest in Gawa. I begin the day with uh, morning prayer and end the day with, with prayer. There are periods in the day where I will uh, engage in contemplative prayer, and Gawar is a wonderful place for that, of course. Um, but as to what I do in the community, uh, this depends on the day, really. I might have a number of meetings in the morning. I might have a funeral, sometimes two. I might have wedding rehearsals or a wedding. Um, I might be going to visit people who are ill, taking communion to them. Uh, visiting the, uh, the various places where, uh, of care homes and uh, schools and where people are. I'm uh, uh, a member of the governors in Van Ridian School and I'm also a trustee at St. Maddox Christian Centre in Van Maddox. So those involve meetings, of course. It's very difficult to talk about routine uh, because life isn't routine, but what is important to me and I, I think is something that maybe the church can can be in the life, the busy lives of people in this time is uh, a place to, to stop and just to find the moment to, to actually be, to actually uh, to exist in the moment and that's why I will find times no matter uh, how hectic the day is I will find five minutes or twenty minutes if I'm lucky to just stop, look at the marsh, to stand under the yew tree, to just 
sit in a, a shed that uh, my wife and I have put in the, the garden of the vicarage, a place to, to just be still and be silent. And I think really, if the church can, can make this space in people's lives, then, then that, is, that is the church doing what it is, it's called to do, because it is in the stopping, in the presence of presence, if we are present, then we actually meet God because God is always present. God is in the busyness of the day. But we can't know it unless we stop. Music has uh, been part of my life ever since I can remember. And uh, I compose music and uh, write songs. But uh, my past has been very much in rock music. I played for a rock band in London uh, during the 1980s and lived that kind of lifestyle. But uh, for me, the, the music that really gets to my heart is, uh, is Celtic music. And it's more of that that I use in my, my ministry. I, I use songs from time to time. Um, but it's really the way that Celtic music can, uh, can just draw people into who they are and uh, to pull on the emotion and to uh, to take us beyond I suppose the intellect uh, what I really love about uh, playing the, the whistle or the uh, or the flute or, or the boron or, or whatever it is uh, the didgeridoo <laughs> is that uh, it's not intellectual really and if you intellectualize it you actually spoil it and uh, you, you, you come into uh, trouble. You, you need to play from the heart and uh, that's what the music is all about. So um, I use it in during services, I use it in different situations. I'm doing a lot of recording at the moment with um, a flautist. He's, uh, he's a classical flautist who's played in uh, the London Philharmonic Orchestra and the Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra. He's played a lot in South Africa uh, and actually has played with Carl Jenkins, uh, one of the, the local heroes from, from here. Um, but uh, he, his style, working with my more improvisational style, has produced some music um, which uh, is being recorded at the moment for an album. And uh, that's another way to, to bring people to, to the message of Christ uh, through music. Uh, music is evocative. Sometimes preaching can be uh, just a switch off. And uh, so music helps me in that way. Oxjam was a festival where uh, music was used to help raise awareness of Oxfam. And uh, music can be used very much in, in charity. So uh, I engage with uh, festivals. Um, in various places, really to, to help to, to raise consciousness uh, about people in need. It's very much uh, in my heart is uh, uh, concern for the marginalized. And uh, we can talk about the, the different kinds of people that are marginalized. But I think that the whole earth is being marginalized at the moment. And uh, uh, a place like Gower is... Uh, somewhere where we can be reminded of, of the beauty of God's creation. So where does the music come from? What inspires me to write songs? Well, music has been with me all my life. And uh, early like youth uh, was a, a hard time for me. I didn't like school. And uh, as I mentioned before, I, I spent as much time out of school as I possibly could. I used to go down to the beach. Uh, and Mitch down there, uh, but I would take a guitar and uh, so music would come out of that and for me God is, the, God is the inspiration for music. I remember Bob Dylan saying he doesn't know where those great songs come from. Uh, he just tapped into something somewhere and for me that, that is what music is uh, uh, when it's authentic. It's, it's tapping into something that's already there and is God given. So. Uh, what inspires me about Gower and the people of Gower? Gower is uh, a thin place. It's a place where the Celts uh, used to say that the distance between heaven and earth is just three feet, but in a thin place. 
it's much closer than that. Well, in Gawa it is much closer than that. And when I walk on the marsh, or I come here to St. David's Church, or to St. Ridian's, or uh, to St. Gwynor's, or across Gawa, because now it's a, a ministry area, we, uh, we take services in, in churches across Gawa. And uh, it's just got a spirituality about it that uh, is so conducive to, uh, to life, to, to actually sensing life. And I'm not just talking about material living, I'm talking about existence. Uh, because uh, the Christian uh, belief is that we are immortal. Christ raises us. In Christ we are alive. The kingdom of heaven is upon you. The kingdom of heaven is within you. The kingdom of heaven is surrounding you. It is breaking in. The kingdom of heaven is in the eyes of the other. There's a quietness about the people of Gawa and the way that they go around doing what they do. Uh, quite often there is uh, planning and um, uh, desire for the, the church to, to, uh, to work with the community. Well, the people of Gawa, they're already working in the community. They're already giving of themselves and their faith and their lives. The people of the church are living out their Christian lives. And they don't need to have any organization. They don't need to have any labels given to them. There is a quiet faithfulness and authenticity about the people here that inspires me. And so to, to minister to these people is, uh, it's just a natural thing and, it, and it's a pleasure. I have a heart, as I mentioned, for the marginalized. And um, the world is being treated disrespectfully. It has been for a long, long time because the way of, of Western societies, at least, is uh, a way of, of materialism and of short-term gain. And the earth, the animals, the trees, the sea, the environment have been so badly abused. But Gawa is a place where people can come still and be touched by God's creation. And I think if Gawa has something to offer as church, as people, as place, it's to the souls of humankind. It's to answer the violence in the world with peace and respect for God's creation. There are many places in Gawa that inspire me. Giant's Grave is one. Uh, the Pulsti Valley is a very special place, and I used to live down on Pulsti Beach when I was a child. Uh, but Arthurstone is a, a very special place, and a place that I will go for walks to very often. Um, these, these places put us in touch with uh, our, our inheritance of, um, uh, with the Celtic tradition. And uh, with the, the church of the past, with the Druids, with the, uh, the people of Gawa. Uh, but Arthurstone is, is such a place evocative. There's a story of uh, St. Ichtid, who apparently was one of King Arthur's knights. Uh, the story was written in the Middle Ages, so it might not be terribly reliable. But there's a story of him going down to the marsh to, uh, to meet the... Uh, the body of a king uh, brought on a raft and he meets the body and he takes the body into a cave and into the mountain. It's not mentioned as being Gower and a lot of people think that it's uh, in Fantwood Major or somewhere like that. But uh, who knows? There are caves just behind Clanridian Church and if you follow those caves into the mountain you will come underneath Arthur's stone. 